Well, you think uh, we better uh, jump now into uh, intuition because we've got some hard work left to do. You remember where we were at lunchtime as far as the resources were concerned. We had God Drop Soul Avatar. <coughs> I think we were all in agreement on that. And then we sort of stuck in, but I think we just barely snuck in the inherited wisdom. Because I, I think a good many people still feel only really comfortable if they feel intuition comes direct from God. Uh, I just call this to your attention. And I, I think you really should tell yourself that this is how you really feel about it, if it is your real feeling. Because then I think somewhere or another you need to make a little bit of room for entry for other possible things. Because I think the division between the conscious and the subconscious <coughs> mind uh, has more complexities in back of it than just the drop soul God avatar. There are other things. So then we went on and also at the very tip end uh, I just stuck myself into the middle and said, well now I take the floor. And I said, really, to be perfectly honest, we've got to be honest when we're dealing with this subject. We've got to admit that the manner in which Sanskara's impressions, desires, habits, manifest themselves is something that comes from the conscious body. It tells us very simply, these are all stored in the mental body, and that certainly is behind uh, the, the barrier between the conscious and the subconscious. So there has to be room in our mind somewhere that they can get through and hide, you know, the wolf in sheep's clothing. And we think it's, it's a big, startling, terribly valued, val valid, valuable uh, intuition that we're having about something we should do. Uh, there's another thing, and then we'll go right back to where we've all got to pitch in together. Uh, back in the 1920s, I was a little kid, and I remember still a great many people who were very occupied with something that was called a Ouija board. And that was a funny little thing, it just looked something like a miniature grand piano. And you put that on an alphabet board, something like Baba's, and then two people put their hands at opposite sides of the table on, I think they called it a plunge, or maybe this was the French word for it. Anyway, you put it on this little baby grand piano, and it sizzled around over the alphabet board and stopped on this letter and that letter and finally spelled out various different words. And at that time I remember several of my friends who were very much uh, enamored by this the talking uh, of a word that didn't mean too much to me at first. They talked about coloring. Have you ever heard of coloring? No. You know, this is not artistic, but it's what I would call um, a psychic. Ego coloring. What it simply comes down to is that the person's own uh, strong bents, prejudices, insistences of what they feel they have to have in life would color and change the material that was coming through. And they would say, well, this is a person who has almost no coloring of what they receive. This also is an even more important term in the field of mediumship still exists, as you all know, and which was very popular in many circles, you know. You go to a good medium, and the medium comes through with a message uh, to you from Great Aunt Tilly or Cousin Jill or whatever not. They're supposed to give you good advice or just say that everything is fine and they're happy and well. But they're also uh, mediums who were classified as to whether they were mediums who uh, produced colored, highly colored material meaning that their own subconscious got in the way. So, uh, when we start getting into uh, the question of what Sanskaras do to, uh, to intuition, I think this, this concept of coloring, the word itself, it's, it's graphic, it tells us something. It means that here is a color that is superimposed in some way or another over an original. You uh, have an original, let's say, portrait, and then something is put over it and the color has changed. So the nature of what is coming through is changed. This is, I think, what we have to be very, very aware of. Because, of course, even one's own inherited wisdom, as a matter of principle, can color 
something that drops old God Avatar is pushing on through. Because even inherited wisdom is not direct truth. Would you agree with that, uh, Tom? <clears throat> well, direct truth means from God. Mm -hmm. If there's any coloring, then to that degree, mm -hmm. it's not direct it's truth. It's not direct truth. Yeah. But I think what I'm trying to say is that even something that has its origin, the original impulse and direct God, and then makes its way through the subconscious, even if it's direct, even if it starts as direct God, it can still be influenced in the transit process. So this is this is what is involved in this pretty serious matter to deal with. Do you have any, any questions at all on that? Excuse me, Don, could mm -hmm. I just yeah. to extent to mention something regarding that that uh, Reggie brought up earlier, and she talked about the process of translation into language. Mm -hmm. And Baba talks about, for example, your higher self, your master, however that would come through, mm -hmm. whispering in the voice of intuition. Sure. But it has to get translated into language, and that's where some of the coloring can come in, where that's we easy. interpret that yeah. fundamental feeling in a way which is perhaps colored with some self-interest yeah. or some influence of past sense cards. Very, very good point. Um, I remember as you were talking about that, that I had uh, the feeling I wanted to say a tiny bit more on that as well. Uh, I've noticed especially things that have to do with intuitions on God Speaks. Um, um, my intuitions on God Speaks have, for me, obviously been born primarily through the extremely intense work of the three translations into French, German, and Spanish. And at least two of those I have had to compare repeatedly, word for word, the original English with the translated word. I don't do the translating, but I've been around Bob enough and I've been around these three languages enough so that I have a sense when the word rings a little bit strange to me. And for that reason, then, I'm the one who has to then go sit down with the translator and we discuss back and forth until I have the sense that the translator has found the word that expresses what I feel intrinsically Bob is, is saying. And that intensive work and the intuitions in relation to God's peace, they just it began to be a snowstorm. Poor old Tom had to read some of them as they were coming along. And this, to me, was precipitated by really working intensively with Baba's words. And the thing that I noticed was that as, first of all, I'd have the key ideas either, let's say, when I had to get up at 3.30 to go to the bathroom or when I was stepping out of the shower. So I'm one of these quiet ones. I have to have the extraneous things removed for me before uh, the intuition starts coming through for me. But I noticed then, because I've always had this feeling, and I think this is another important point, I had the immediate prejudice that putting down the notes right then and there even it's 3.30 in the morning and I'm shivering in the cold, is a necessary process. This is part of continuing work with intuition. But then beyond that, I also had, maybe you, you say, well, Stephen, it sounds horrible, I don't want any intuition. But during the course of the day, not a day after or two days after, but in the course of the day before I went to bed, I have to sit down at the computer and write up these notes and I always find that at that point, the notes are embellished in a more full form. Just as if, let's say, they were coming from Arish back to Baba, and Baba goes over them and adds this and changes and corrects that. And one of the things, Tom, that just has startled me almost is every once in a while, on the computer, I'm starting to write a word, and I just have the instinctive sense, no, 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 Tom. Sure, that's the way you wrote it in the note, but it's, it's not the correct thing. So there's a sentinel somewhere back there that is functioning in relation to these intuitions and has a keen sense of the proper word. And this is what came to my mind when we were talking about clothing them in words. Somewhere in this process is a terribly sensitive and accurate, I call him the sentinel. And he really does a sentinel's job. And all of a sudden he puts up his hand and says, Halt! Got it. And so I try two or three words, and then all of a sudden I feel at ease, and I put it down on the computer. 
So specific words are terribly important in this whole process. Yeah, and there's more just to this process of working out and you know sharing some of the intuitions that you had, uh, then her correspondence would ensue, questions, uh, comments, intuitions that were provoked by that, uh, in original intuition. And in the group that was reading this, uh, there was a cross-fertilization. Mm -hmm. And so we became immediately aware of the value of a companionship group committed to the truth, being very honest, not having any axe to grind, not having any, you know, uh, a pride of place of putting the truth first. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's things like this now that we have to deal with principally this afternoon. Uh, if if we want to, we can cut a lot of brains and say, well, we've been a little superficial in putting down, uh, say, three or three and a half main resources for intuition and add on. But now we've got to find out a little bit about what promotes intuition and what helps uh, to keep... Uh, this thing that's set up like that from getting tipped over as it comes through. So I think, I think, Tom, you bear me out here. I think what we should dip into now are the, what, the frames which we might try to institute in our daily life to facilitate, to, uh, to invite intuition. And does anybody have any suggestions on this? Please, Ken. Well, I noticed that um, most of the time, you know, I, because of my life is so sped up with work, that uh, I have to usually calm myself by just allowing the thoughts to rise and let go. The first thing I usually have to do is first let go of thought and allow myself to just begin to, I always remember the saying that uh, love is always bigger than whatever I'm feeling. And uh, so I usually, for myself, um, don't believe my thoughts, but allow things to still. What happens is that... So you think as long as you're thinking that it's suspicious and that you some way must, uh, let's say, stop this? No, quiet. you can't stop thinking. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is allow, when the thoughts come up, to not put identity to them. And what many times will happen for myself is that as time goes along, uh, usually I, I like to do it after I've done, said the prayers or my wish or you know uh, one of those one of these things that I like to do because they're usually a spark that a word or a phrase or something will ignite. And so what will happen for myself will be uh, it's impossible to stop thinking. But it is, uh, there, there is the nature mind and or there, that you're really trying to tap into at that. Uh, and so I, that's how I feel connected at that point. And that's usually, after also I've talked to Baba and I've honestly laid before him everything that has occurred. And what I find is suddenly that honesty, those prayers, that silence, uh, is really a, a beginning of laying myself bare and allowing intuition <clears throat> to perhaps uh, come about. And, uh, so for you, silence or quiet is a necessary condition for, for the uh, intuition to start to manifest. Yeah, all day long. Even, uh, even you know, in the middle of the day, I will usually close my door to my office or I'll go for a, a drive in my car, mm -hmm. just to, uh, uh, you know, kind of instead of stop spiraling, spiraling out of my own self. Mm -hmm. Well, this is uh, a good description yes. of the sort of thing that one needs to do. Does anyone have some more to add to this? Because, you know, this is a pretty individualistic process. I think Nancy's Straightening up as if she's going to swing an eight meter reader. Do you have something that, that's? I was thinking about what you said. I, I know I do meditate, and um, mm -hmm. I notice the difference completely in my mind if I'm too busy and I'm late and I don't meditate. 
And it's not that particularly at that moment I have intuition, but it seems as though having that focus and that quiet time, even sitting, will change change my being in a sense that I am more receptive during the day mm -hmm. that, uh, to anything that happens. So you link the intuitive process um, with the meditative process in your mind, then? Well, I, I'll, I'll say intuitive. No, I, I just, I function better. Mm -hmm. I just function better. If I have, mm -hmm. at the beginning of a quiet time, a center time, before I kind of hit the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just have one question. Sorry, if you don't want to um, How would you address this? Uh, how do you distinguish a thought from intuition? How do you recognize it? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would just jump right in the middle there and say awful easy because a thought process, as far as I'm concerned, is something which is very closely associated with my conscious will or desires. I know the context. It's there. I have some control. Uh, I know the background of it. So, in other words, it is something which happens in the context, which is normal, daily, and I know the roots of it, and so on. It doesn't happen unexpectedly. Whereas an intuition, as I think a number of people have suggested this morning, uh, springs up absolutely unexpectedly, so completely out of context, and so illogically unrelated to anything in a logical process. Suddenly there, it's just almost as if um, you were looking at the sky and uh, uh, suddenly right in the middle you saw a flying saucer and it wasn't there a fraction of a second before. Where the hell did it come from and what is it? It's just that unexpected. Did I just have help? Hmm? Please, go ahead. And one thing that came out in our discussion uh, in the, the groups that we've done so far and some of the emails and listening to a lot of people's experiences, it seems that intuition isn't necessarily the, the big flashing neon sign that lights up in your, in your life, although it can be that, but we're getting intuitions all the time. A lot of what happens in our mind, if we observe our mind, what Ken was talking about, really is a type of meditation in which we remain silent, but just let the thoughts flow along and don't identify with the thoughts, don't stop the process, don't become the thinking mind, and allow that silence to be there. And then we can begin to distinguish between the stream of consciousness, which is just sort of those sanskaras, whatever, unwinding themselves, and some response to something in the environment, which may be a very intuitive response, which I think Ken is also talking about as a business person, successful business person, he obviously is able to do that because to be creative, to be successful, you do have to be using intuition of some sort all the time. And when one is in a particular circumstance and one is available to oneself, not distracted, not scattered, then something comes up, and it may be verbally expressed in the mind, or it may be an instantaneous reaction. I think someone talked about, Dorothy, I think, talked about avoiding the potholes. I mean, it's something as simple as that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily even get labeled as a thought in the mind, but it's there, and you're absolutely sure of it, and you take action immediately on it. And that's an intuition. And we don't usually honor in, you know, that kind of thing as an intuition, but it's an important part of everybody's life and it's part of what makes us creative people and certainly characterizes the people that are successful because in their field they're probably a little better able to do it than their competition. No, hey, excuse me, no, oh, because I saw Adele raising her oh, hand. So sorry. Adele, you wanted to add something there. I thought it has said so much about what this age is all about. And this had been the agreement about that transition. You bring about what so I what does he mean by that? What he means always resolves to love me more and more and more and deserve whatever grace I give you. The grace of this next step is here, which we are 
putting in this advent is the gift of higher understanding. Higher consciousness. On this ladder of consciousness. Well, wait a minute, Even Adele, 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 I've got to interrupt you. I can't hear you. Adele, no, no, no. I want to interrupt Adele for a very. I want to be sure that when you say higher consciousness, what do you mean? This is Baba. Now you're speaking. But this is Baba preparing us by quieting the mind and <clears throat> speeding up the heart. Yeah. By telling us that which is real yeah. is given to But how is All the higher this training <clears throat> has been to quiet the mind? But higher consciousness in what sense? This one we got to have out. Uh, well, God this is thinks central. he's given to us, has he not uh, given us a ladder of consciousness? I don't think so, Adele. There is the, the reason, yes, the mean, reason that I insist. As insisting. much as we can grasp of it, mm. he has told us there is the lowest room we've only been told is the intellect. The lowest room. Mm. All right, then a little above that is insight. And Are you speaking in the evolutionary? The evolutionary. Or the, all right. So well, we start out with gases and so on and go up through the evolutionary. Well, I don't building. know. The, um, Pardon? I, I believe uh, certainly in the way the beloved Baba has paraphrased his teachings in many ways, mm. he has talked about a ladder of consciousness. Yeah, but, but it's so important because. I think I've told the story that I had to be the errand boy between Purdom and Baba for about three years on the argument of expanding consciousness and higher degrees and higher levels of consciousness. And Baba was so terribly insistent to get a possible misconception straightened out that really I had to go through hell trying to be the errand boy between the three of them. And this, this is why when I uh, dealt uh, speaks of higher consciousness. I want to be sure of where we are at that point. Well, higher Bob than hmm? well, well are we are, are we human beings now? And is this a higher stage in a human being? Uh, I, I, I was okay. Well, this is where Baba done. argued for three years with Purdom, Adele. Well, I just have to be honest with you. Yeah. He so, said, from the first human incarnation, Consciousness is complete, and all that happens is the unveiling of that consciousness. Yes, the unveiling. The unveiling, but that is not higher consciousness. This is what he wanted Burdum to understand. Oh, I see. Yeah. So that, that's Adele why I was so sassy and broke in, but it is such an important point to Baba. I wanted to be sure it was clear. Just semantics. Is it question? Boy, well, they were semantics that Baba spent three years <laughs> going back and forth with Burdum. So it's that important. Well, I think it's actually a little more than semantics, because that's what I said to Don. I had this the same go back and forth with Don. Yeah, every once in a while we get into a good... Well, uh, and it's actually an important point, because Baba does, <clears throat> if you read the his, historical understanding, Baba does make a contribution and in his emphasis. Who makes the Baba makes a contribution to the understanding of consciousness in that he makes it very clear how the process of evolution is the building of a physical body, a subtle body, and a mental body. And as soon as the three bodies are completely built, consciousness is full and you take on a human form. So nothing more is added to that. Everything is already available. Consciousness is at its peak, which is at the stage where it can reflect and know itself as God. And but, there is no purpose for the moon to go any higher. Bob is so the, visibly the word is unveiled. Right. But the sanskaras are the veils, and of course then they yeah. must be revealed. <coughs> so this the is more proper terminology, if we want to get down to semantics, is the higher awareness of consciousness but the consciousness is full from the first human. That was the, it was the point of the word awareness yes. that finally came into the center of the argument, exactly what Tom brought up here. And he said, Don, finally, Purdom is confused because he is confusing awareness, which can be very complex and sophisticated, but it does not necessarily mean that that awareness is based on a higher state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. This is where Purdom went astray. It's a, it's, it sounds like a semantical uh, uh, differentiation, but it's key, absolutely key. I think this is also very key to the whole discussion of source of intuition. 
because if we already have full consciousness and we're simply veiled from it, then we can look at intuition as somehow a peek through a veil. And there are many veils, so it's not a peek to the full consciousness, but it's some little veil perhaps just getting... <coughs> Grace, it's all good, but how, how do you get that myself? How do you get that? Well, I think that's so another, that yeah. You know, your, your mind is sufficiently quiet so that you can feel the uh, awareness. I think that there's... How, the, how, I mean, that's the key word is grace. Grace. I think that you, you brought something that. very important up there, right. because ordinary intuition, yeah. we can explain in the terms we have been, in terms of the samskaras and things of that sort. But there's another level, and Baba said, I come not to teach, but to awaken. And that awakening is certainly a form of grace. grace but how is it expressed in one's own life? Intuition, one knows something. One is, it may perhaps instantaneously sure, Baba is the, is the island. Well, let's go back and be, you had your hand up, please, Mom. Uh, just, uh, just came to mind that, um, I don't know how, this is scientifically, or you know, it's true, but a child up to the age of maybe six or seven, um, they don't necessarily act up based on their son's call, as I've heard. Like a child of a four to fifth year old. Um, so they're like, whatever sounds for us that they bring into that life of incarnation is not completely unwind. So, uh, could we say that children, let's say at the age of one or like two to five, they're fully intuitive and they are aware of their full consciousness, yet they don't act on it? I mean, could we degree the, you know, the, the, the intuitive level of a child and a grown old, you know, woman mm -hmm. like me, for example? <laughs> for example. You know, I don't recall Baba explaining that in that detail and what you refer to. I'd be interested to, to see that reference. I think Baba said there's different sun stars for children up to seven. But there's still sun stars. There's still sun stars, but they're much lighter. But they don't um, generate new sun stars until they're seven. Right. Right. They have no responsibility. Responsible the same way they're not responsible. But they're still sun stars. So they're, they're not getting the direct. Excuse me, I'd, I'd cut off the fellow you had your hand up, but I knew Adele had her hand up first. But I think we owe you the floor. For Thank you very much for giving me a precious moment to share with you in reference to this matter. Um, in reference to intuition, how can how can I be sure that I am not utilizing my desires and wants, and how can I make my intuition uh, more uh, more apparent to me? And, more, uh, more real to me, you know? All right, that's a direct question, and I'll give you a direct answer, at least that comes from my experience. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, thank me after you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> first, first thing is that I have found in the process of, especially intuitions related to the work on God Speaks, that this sentiment, that I speak of. Believe me, uh, the presence of the sentinel function is very real to me. I know it. It's there. And I've seen it operate many times. And it seems to have a very, very keen capacity to know what I have put down and registered consciously. And it seems to have a very keen knowledge of when there has been something mistaken in that process. And so, in that case, if something apparently uh, kind of screwed up or colored or pushed or tilted, uh, some days, usually several days later, there will be a further intuition on the same subject. But there will be some new material in it, and there will be a discrete uh, changing of certain words or concepts. It's rare that something is totally changed. But uh, first of all, this is what I call internal self truly To me, this is a very real function. It's something that goes along. Terribly important. 
I think it's terribly important that we give credence to it and time for it. Uh, I have observed myself, uh, certainly in my earlier days, when I was having intuitions, uh, mostly in the laboratory of all things. There is terribly exciting intuition that functions in scientific areas. I know this. Uh, so I would notice in the, the earlier days that when I'd be writing out a report based on two, three months of laboratory experiments, and uh, all of a sudden, oh, gee, this now, I hadn't thought of it, but maybe this explains why that all happened that way. And I would leap one leap ahead. Intuition frequently leaps a stage beyond our actual base of knowledge. This is one of the exciting things about it. It's sort of like a mystery story. You think you know where the villain or uh, the bank robber or whatever not uh, is hidden. And so you get on the trail and you devise more experiments. But I would find that I was so excited by this intuition that hit me that I took it for real immediately. This is the, this is the tendency of the exhilaration. Your ego latches on to it and says, look what I did. So there is a tremendous tendency of for one's ego to do exactly what Baba says the ego does when you go on the spiritual path. You know, you put your spiritual cloak around you and the ego says, I'm a great saint, look how good I am. Baba warns us about this. But I find that it does exactly the same thing with intuition. So the first, first thing that goes on is that there is a sentinel and there is some self-truing that goes on. And if you give it time, if you've gone off the path, you get through some indications of the fact uh, that this was tilted and that, that was a badly chosen word or concept or something of that sort. But then there is the second stage of truing, and Tom has referred to this two, three times this morning, and that is what a group can do. And there's a very, very simple and straightforward principle in, involved in that. And I think it explains my own enthusiasm the last message on the alphabet board and the inner links. If you have, let's say, a small group of uh, compatible companions, I call them companions, because really if you've got an internal link, you've got something even beyond friendship. I can only call it the sort of companionship that all of the Mondali who went in the new life would bother talk about the great, incomparable experience of companionship with Baba. This is important. I think it was important because it goes hand in hand with the age of intuition. And to me, companionship is a necessary part of the function of truing. It carries one stage beyond, but you can true yourself even if you're patient and brutally honest with yourself. Now, let's take just a quick look at it because I think it's so terribly important. Suppose let us say that you do have five or six people that you form real inner links and you form a really compatible <coughs> relationship. You can have arguments, but you don't break that inner link with them. It never risks that. It isn't of that sort of thing. You're not trying to put them down. You're really existing with them because you love them. That's all there is to it. It's a very basic form of trusting love that is established. So, okay, Tom's in from my group of trusted companions. We've got real inner links. All of a sudden, I have an intuition that Maybe I say, well, uh, I better be a little careful here. I may have gotten this a bit screwed up. And so I wait patiently for two or three or four days or a week or two. And then finally I think, well, I haven't had any contrary further intuitions on this. i got to tell this to old pal Tom over here. But I trust him. I think he'd be really interested in what's going on. And this actually happens, of course. And uh, Tom says, Many times he said, gee, was that's exciting. I get excited about it, too. And I feel great, of course. And once in a while, because Tom is a different individual, he has a different Samskari pattern than I have. So he's got strong Samskaris in some field where I'm pretty free of them. And he is free, pretty well, of Samskaris in some fields where I've got some great big ones, which are more likely to color my intuitions. So as a consequence, when I tell Tom about my intuition, if it has come through an area of strong Sanskaric influence in my life, it's likely to be colored and it's true, misguided. But Tom, in that particular area, is pretty free. So instinctively, just listening to the words, it goes right, let's say, straight to, to I think, the soul, the drop soul. And he 
he, he sort of judges and he says, something sounds out of kilter there. And because he's a trusted companion, and he knows it, and companionship means, you know, the truth is truth, and we've all got to help each other. And Tom, with hopefully chosen words, says, Don, uh, excuse me, but I just think something's a little bit awry there. So he trades punches with me. This is the function of companionship, truly. And this, I think, is absolutely essential if one is going to get somewhere really seriously along in the path of intuition. So for me, there are two things. First of all, your own sentinel knows what has come through and can be trusted to do a pretty good job of truing for you. If you get openness, you don't think you're God Almighty and that what you have gotten has to be exact. You know, so many people, when they suddenly have a spiritual vision, they, they think it's the Word of God and it's absolutely right and that's it. And they tell you about it, and if you don't agree totally, well, of course, you're disagreeing with the Word of God. You don't even entertain the possibility that something might be here and there bound up in the material. So brutal honesty and flexibility are just plain watchwords. Somewhere or another, one has got to cultivate those. But then, okay, that helps the sentinel function get the thing through. But there can be some more serious colors involved. That's when I've got to have the Toms and the Adels and uh, the Charlies around. They help with the truing process. And that I call the truing process of group companionship. It's invaluable. And this is laid down, as far as I'm concerned, in the various concepts and messages that Father has given us. It's there. Adele. And it's also laid down in the actual life of the Father. Would you speak a little louder, Adele? This, this whole, uh, I guess, stand louder. We can't I hear you over It's very evident up. that the dynamic just described by Don is a dynamic that he picked up from observing Baba and his own companions. Absolutely. Couldn't be truer. This you absorb from example. Father says one of the great functions of the avatar is to give us a living example. And you just pick it up. You don't, many times you don't even think about it. And then you put it into practice when you're in the practical like situation. It comes naturally. Yeah, and the words that we pick up from the true of words that Father gave us, mm -hmm. we don't think about it. They are, they have their own life process within us. That's the same from the figure there. Yes, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Can I have some clarification in reference to this letter? How would you distinguish intuition not having to do with your desires and wants? You know, how, how, how do you know? I mean, if, if it simply comes, how do you know you have anything to do with your desire or your wants? Mm -hmm. And it actually is. Mm -hmm. All right, suppose let's say I've been just uh, foolhardy and uh, strong-minded and I say this is terrific intuition, I'm going to put it into action, it's important, and so I ramrod it through. All right, what's going to happen in that particular case is there are certain results that have come out of it. Well, uh, as a number of people have pointed out in various different groups over the last several days, you may then get some results that are pretty sour grapes out of your intuition. But does this mean that that was a bad intuition? Maybe this is something that, say, karmically, that you have got to get straight in your own life and your own deep feeling and a rebalancing that is set out. So what you would call an, a, 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 a false intuition may not be false at all, but actually a terribly helpful intuition, a helpful course of action to get you straightened out as a human being in an important phase of your life. One just has to be terribly open and flexible. And brutally <coughs> honest. And again, I go back and say, real companions, two, three, four, five, six real companions, are worth their weight in gold in this whole process. This is where they really come in. Way back and back there. You talked about what facilitates um, intuition. It's sort of been touched on. But somebody have to create the opportunity to be surprised. So let's say you're trying to work through a problem, and if you keep focusing on it, you can mm -hmm. keep getting stuck. Mm -hmm. So whether it's meditation or going for a car drive or 
doing the dishes, getting outside of whatever you were thinking about, sort of somehow clears away the cob the clutter, it's like mm -hmm. cobwebs to allow you to be surprised. And then like what Kathy was talking about earlier is sometimes it comes to you from a totally unexpected source. If you're Many times it does. Yeah, you know, it could it could be a novel, it could be a TV, it could be a mm -hmm. line from a movie mm -hmm. or and you were doing that because you wanted to be entertained, or, or whatever it was, you weren't focused on what you were trying to solve. And may I add another type of category, which is terribly important to that, and I don't mean to cut you off, but the example of what happens to me again and again and again in God Speaks is, it ain't nothing out here which is new in my observation. It's just that for the 40th time I've read two, three words in God Speaks, and I've always read them, yes, 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 yes. And then, on the 34th time, all of a sudden, my God, I, I never really saw those words before. So what I'm terribly familiar with already, suddenly, I perceive a deeper implication which had never, never cropped into my... Just my little story of God Speaks this morning. After 40 years of arguing with editors and shivering in my boots, are they going to accept it or not? Then all of a sudden, God, should we take that title seriously? You know, it's the same thing, but somewhere or another, something way deep down inside of you, and I seriously suspect the avatar says, okay, now it's time for Don to wake up out of his dream here. And so he opens a little door, and so something that never went through that door before goes through finally. But this comes back to what I think is the essence of Baba's usage of the word work, and that is that contact with something, even though you've had it repeatedly, you work over it for various different reasons, opens the potentiality for a deeper level of meaning to emerge. And this above all is true of God Speaks. Uh, I think I may have told you here in the group, and if not, it's so important, I'll tell you, I'll tell you again. Uh, I had read God Speaks, uh, I don't know how many times until Three years ago, somewhere around uh, the middle of the part Baba dictated to Harish, for the first time I noted consciously, my God, Baba put together three key words, infinite individualized consciousness. And I had never, I had read that many times, but I had never been conscious of the word individualized infinite consciousness, infinite consciousness, infinite consciousness. That's the way I always read it. And then suddenly my mind opened up and said, my God, here he says it's, it's infinite individualized consciousness. <clears throat> and of course, then immediately I almost jumped out of my chair and said, hooray, there's where you and I come in. <laughs> and it made sense and it opened up a whole huge new area. So I got out to the computer disk uh, I was doing it in French at the time, and it was all on the computer disk in front of me. And so in 20 minutes, I searched through all of the chapters to find wherever the word individual occurred. And four times, three times after this place, he links the four, the three words together. So this is not an accident. It means that he introduced the concept halfway through that is not just infinite consciousness, which is product of the surging of the wind, but it's individualized. So in other words, consciousness is not just a flat, even lake, it's a lumpy lake. Individual, I was thinking of it as sort of a bumpy surface. Now that might seem terrible to describe God as having a bumpy surface, but that's the way he is an extraordinarily more interesting God that results from it. And I just feel so happy that God's got some trees and some lakes and some ponds and some geese around and this and that, and some beautiful symphonies and some marvelous memories of a terrific violin solo and all of these things, you know. And to me, that is what individualized, infinitely individualized consciousness is. And it's a vastly... This, now, mind you, the importance of this, and that is that, as far as I know, I think I've got one of the best uh, founded uh, esotericists uh, in America sitting right beside me. And he confirmed to me uh, that 
Yes, maybe it's implied in ancient esoteric or mystic literature, but it is not said simply, bluntly, as Bob has said it, that it's not just infinite consciousness. When the drop soul comes back to the ocean, it just doesn't disappear into the ocean. That's the end. No, the individualized part remains. And oddly enough, it was only about two years ago uh, when Dick Anderson, uh, who used to be with Berkeley Sufi groups and is quite an individualist himself, came through. He said, you know, there's something in uh, a little uh, collection of discourses that Deshmukh did towards the end, latter part of his life. And he said, you will certainly find something on it. And right there, Baba says that the uh, solution of the Sanskaras, the wiping out of the Sanskaras, is not a total wiping out. What is wiped out is the impulsion, the energy factor, but the quality of the incident itself remains, and that's preserved into eternity. That's where individualization. So I don't got to drink my cup of coffee, but that doesn't mean that I can't remember what a lovely taste of coffee was, but I don't have to have it. So that is where the Sanskaras finally go, that they don't disappear. It is the energy compulsion factor which relates to creation, which goes. And the individualized, Baba does not say this, I have to warn you on this. It's just old Don Stevens who says that it's got to be this way, obviously. But the individualized infinite consciousness was latent in the original, original beyond, beyond state of God. Baba says infinite consciousness is latent. And it takes the whim to transmute that into manifested consciousness. But he doesn't say anything about latent, individualized consciousness. But if it ends up individualized, the individualized had to be latent. Mm -hmm. And he just simplified the story for us for the first four chapters. And then, you see what happens? Then he adds another word, and he said, I've read this 50 times as I always said that I had done. And I miss that individualized infinite consciousness for all of those years, and it's key. But this is a sort of thing that I wanted to refer back to your point. This is a sort of thing where Baba says work, and work is not trying to put things end on end, but allow the contact sufficiently over a period of time for something to soak in so that one allows the buried latency to come out. And it strikes you between the eyes and you say, it's got to be there. Now I see what he's driving at. So it can be simple repetition too. It doesn't have to be a new signboard. You know, it's interesting as you say the word, uh, I just immediately think to myself how many times I've said, I have a feeling so and so. And I think people do. But is this just another way that we label something that is basically an intuition? And one also says, I have a hunch. Or sometimes one says, I have an instinct. And almost always these things have no particular rational basis in having thought through a thing. So I would say, I believe there is a whole vocabulary that we use, sort of folk loric words which relate to intuition. And so let's, let's realize that a lot of these things we're going to have to become more aware of and say, that really belongs under the subject of Baba's gift to mankind, our intuition. Historically, John Dewey talked about intuition as felt thought, mm -hmm. trying to communicate the, the, the blend of mm -hmm. uh, head and heart that occurs in intuition, whereas reason is a thing of the intellect and it's of the mind. Whereas in intuition, we begin to engage the heart in the process of <clears throat> knowledge. Well, I think Tom brings up a whole other area of enormous importance and uh, that we really need to take to heart and reflect on. And that is the blending or the relationship or the balance between head and heart. Um, because we have such a tremendous tendency to say we've got to get rid of the head or otherwise love and the realization of God's not going to come through. But how many times did Baba emphasize to us that the final step involves the equilibrizing of head and heart? And why he makes that important, but and why do we kick it out? Why do we forget that? 
he doesn't say you've got to get rid of the head when he talks about the annihilation of the mind. Can I, can I just tell you something that I think we all have to reflect on? Annihilation of the mind. Is this really the contents of the mind body, which is the storage point of samskaras, both the natural and the non-natural? Is this what Baba means by the annihilation of the mind? I begin to suspect that's it. And I think that's where the perfect master comes in, because we've got, as Baba said, that we can't get rid of the uh, natural samskaras. He said they're so deeply enrooted that we just can't go through the reverse habit patterns to get them out. So we've got to have the help of a perfect master. And so I think that is why he says that to go from the sixth to the seventh plane, you've got to have the help of a perfect master. And if you start to reflect on it, I think we went over this in the seminar on God's speech. Your physical functions, your metabolic, digestive, even the nerve processes are built on tremendously complex habit patterns. And so the laws of your body are built on those natural samskaras. So if you tried, even if you were successful in getting rid of the natural ones, you'd kill yourself pretty darn fast. You would foul up your metabolism and your digestion and a few other critical processes and you wouldn't be alive much longer. So I think when we've done our job on the non-natural decision-making, ones that we had control over, our job is done, and then God, Avatar, toss into the equation the perfect master to get rid of those for us. Yes, Ken? Well, yeah, I was, I suddenly just uh, popped up in my mind, uh, I know, and especially in this last year or so, with uh, that vow of honesty, uh, also, in listening to the two of you talk, the, the, the kept feeling the word vulnerability and, and group and the true and how vulnerability, I know with friends uh, or perceived friends, however you want, how that truing vulnerability is in truing our intent or how I view intent and motive and how with that uh, really is a... Um, a real opening of grace by, uh, you know, by, by allowing myself to um, be in that. It's a hell of a situation that you've got to open yourself up to something uh, such as vulnerability in order really to be deeply honest and to be able to true. But I don't know any other way to do it. You can't open yourself up without becoming vulnerable. And that takes an awful lot of courage. I think this is the value of internal links, because if you proceed on the internal links, and those are intuitive, how do I know I have an internal link with someone? You know, I feel that link, that's as evident as myself. If I proceed on that level, then my risk is minimized. You know, but to love is to risk, and if you don't want to risk, then you can't love build the wall up around yourself. But if we go on the basis of internal links, then even if we are wounded in that risk, it's still worth the risk because if we if we love, then the wound is not a big deal. You know, it's we realize it's simply an arrow of karma coming back and we can thank the, the loved one for giving us that arrow. I mean, Certainly, Baba did that on many occasions with the mandalay with the back of his hand, you know. And he took a big risk to, to become a disciple of Baba. In the same way, there's a certain degree of risk to be a companion, but the reward of love is so much greater. And uh, to me, talking about feeling, talking about the heart, I mean, intuition is the lead into that. And as we follow that lead, then we can really move on to the level of love, really recognize and uh, develop those internal links. And then intuition moves on to higher and more expanded levels. Tom, why don't we stop there and take a look at heart and love in relation to intuition? Mm -hmm. Because I think this is certainly one of the most important aspects of intuition. We really ought to take a careful look at it. Where love comes in, maybe where it doesn't come in. Uh, 
um, what, the, what does Baba really imply about love? 